Good morning. Good morning, Earl. Our first reading will be from the New Revised Standard Version, Matthew 3, verses 13 through 17. And if you'd like to follow along with me, you'll find this on page 784 in the Pew Bibles. And we're going to a baptism, <laughs> the baptism of Jesus. Then Jesus came from Galilee to John at the Jordan to be baptized by him. John would have prevented him, saying, I need to be baptized by you, and you come to me. But Jesus answered him, let it be so now, for it is proper for us in this way to fulfill all righteousness. Then he, Jesus, consented. And when Jesus had been baptized, just as he came up from the water, suddenly the heavens were opened to him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting on him. And a voice from heaven said, This is my Son, the Beloved, with whom I am well pleased. Here ends our first reading of the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thank you so much, choir, for that beautiful, powerful, and appropriate hymn, that last line, Come Prince of Peace and Reign. Thank you so much. And thank you, Terry and Maxine, for week to week making, taking time to get the words in the, the text in our bulletins so we can uh, reflect on the words as well as the beautiful music. Well, I wish Art J was sitting right there. He usually is, and because uh, um, I'm going to have a little test later on in this um, message, and he always he's quick with an answer. So, <laughs> so this will be a little bit like going to seminary today, because I've just spent a week with the New Testament professor uh, from Princeton and uh, seminary, and so uh, put your, uh, your school caps on, and we'll go back to school and reflect on this beautiful text from the Book of Acts. It's a beautiful accident of the lectionary, as I'll share later, that this is the text for today. Acts chapter 10, verses 34 through 43. Then Peter began to speak to them, I truly understand that God shows no partiality, but in every nation anyone who fears him and does what is right is acceptable to him. You know the message he sent to the people of Israel, preaching peace by Jesus Christ. He is Lord of all. That message spread throughout Judea, beginning in Galilee after the baptism that John announced. How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power. How he went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. We are witnesses to all that he did, both in Judea and in Jerusalem. They put him to death by hanging him on a tree, but God raised him on the third day and allowed him to appear. Not to all the people, but to us who were chosen by God as witnesses and who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. He commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that he is the one ordained by God as judge of the living and the dead. All the prophets testify about him that everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I invite you to uh, actually to take your New Testament and uh, the Bible in front of you and open it to that. I should have had you do that before I started to read, but if you'd like, you don't have to, but uh, page 895 is that text, and uh, as we go through it, you might want to just keep your eye on that text because it's a very interesting uh, text. Let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts together be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our Redeemer. Amen. Well, a water view is a valuable thing, isn't it? In real estate and in hotel rooms, if you try to reserve a room in a hotel along a river or by the ocean, they'll ask you if you want a water view or a city view. And by city view, they really mean the parking lot. <laughs> The room with a view of the water goes for a lot more than the one with the, with the view of the 
city, doesn't it? Looking out over water is soothing and calming. Psychologists have noticed, noted the healing power of water to lower stress levels and to bring a sense of peace and well-being, even just by being near water and looking upon the water. There's nothing like the view of a sunset over water. And I can see you all kind of drifting away, thinking about places you've been next to water that is truly beautiful. Well, that's the view of the water, but there's also the view from the water, and that can be dramatic, especially here in New York City. Uh, last June, our kids got us a dinner cruise on the Hudson as a gift for our 40th wedding anniversary. We left from the dock on the Jersey side and then cruised up the river before turning around and following the west side of Manhattan all the way down to the Statue of Liberty. And the evening ended with fireworks over the Brooklyn Bridge. The view of the Manhattan skyline at night from the water was something truly beautiful and memorable. Today is baptism of the Lord Sunday and the view from the water is central to the story of Jesus' baptism. In the Gospel of Matthew, that Rose read for us so beautifully, the pivotal moment is when Jesus comes up from the water and has this vision. And the Bible says, and when he was baptized, just as he came up from the water, suddenly the heavens were opened to him and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove, alighting upon him. Well, that's quite a view from the water. You could say it was a heavenly view. It was a view of heaven and the Holy Spirit descending upon him in the form of a dove. The view for Jesus was not only one of beauty, it was a view with a purpose. The vision was one that pointed him to the future that God had in store for him. It was a vision of his anointing, of his commissioning, the beginning of his ministry. It was inauguration day for Jesus. He was being blessed in order to be a blessing to all of humanity. He was about now to embark on his ministry of healing, justice, and peace. Well, that in a nutshell is the message of Baptism of the Lord Sunday. That the babe of Bethlehem of just a few weeks ago is now all grown up and ready to begin his ministry. The natural extension of the baptism of Jesus to then reflect on our own baptism and our own calling to continue Christ's ministry of healing justice and peace. Well, the church calendar has some wisdom in it. They give us this baptism of the Lord uh, Sunday early in the new year as a great way to start off a new year. It's a time of new beginnings. So what better way or better time to reflect on the beginning of Jesus' ministry and then to renew our own vision for ministry, our own view from the water, if you will. And this year, that vision metaphor takes on extra significance because the year is 2020. And who doesn't want 2020 vision? So for the first few weeks of 2020, we will sharpen our focus of the vision that God has for each of us in this time and this place. The lectionary you've heard me refer to is a calendar of Bible readings for each Sunday. And today's readings were taken from the lectionary for Baptism of the Lord Sunday in year A of a three-year cycle. And Matthew is the gospel story that Roe read for us. And this story from Acts is the other New Testament reading for today. And I was excited when I saw this reading scheduled today, for today because it was the focus of a three-hour lecture on last Monday at our conference, kind of just by coincidence. I don't have time to share all the insights of Dr. Eric Barreto, the New Testament professor at Princeton. I'll try to cover his highlights in about half the time he took. Oh, you're paying attention. <laughs> okay, a lot less than that. The Matthew reading gives us that basic story of Jesus' baptism, and then the Acts story takes it to the next level, the so what, or the now what. It's a story of what happens next and how it affects you and me. The first thing a New Testament professor is going to want to do is to set the context for this story in Acts. It reminds me of something one of my professors said, any text without a context is just a pretext. It's important to understand the historical and cultural setting of the original story before we apply it to our own situation. Otherwise, we may just 
distort the meaning and appropriate it for ourselves in a naive, simplistic, and often distorted, misleading way. So even if you did open your New Testament, just flip back a page or so and you'll see headings about the centurion and Peter's dream or vision. The context for this story is a dream that Peter had the day before and then his encounter between Peter and a Roman centurion named Cornelius. Peter had this vision of a, of a food being lowered on a sheet. He must have fallen asleep hungry. I don't know, I can dream about food sometimes. <laughs> Usually food you shouldn't have too much of, like pizza or ice cream. Well, Peter's vision and in that dream was of all kinds of unclean foods, things that he was forbidden to eat. But then a voice told him to get up and eat. Peter resisted, but the voice told him that if God called it clean, who is he to declare it unclean? Peter woke up and then lo and behold, Cornelius knocks on the door. At first, Peter did not want to talk to a Gentile and a Roman soldier, no less, no friend of the Jewish or uh, Christian people. But then he did, realized what that dream was all about. This Roman was not unclean. The dream wasn't about food, it was about people. The gospel, the bread of life, was for everyone. And so once Peter realizes that and he welcomes him in and he sorts that out together, Peter launches into a sermon that we then read in verses 43, or 34 through 43. And his opening line reflects that. He says, I know God shows no partiality. All are equal and welcome in God's eyes, Jew and Gentile, people of every nation. He then prepares to share with Cornelius this buffet of good news that he had been witness to. He gives a title to this mini sermon, you could say, and calls it The Peace of Jesus Christ. He is Lord of all. Beautiful refrain, probably a doxology of the early church. The Peace of Jesus Christ. He is Lord of all. That message, Peter says, spread throughout Judea, beginning in Galilee after the baptism, John announced. And here's the tie-in with baptism of the Lord Sunday. Peter echoes that gospel account of the baptism when he says Jesus was anointed by God with the Holy Spirit and power. Remember the Holy Spirit descending on Jesus at John's baptism? And here Peter says Jesus was anointed by God with the Holy Spirit and power. And then what did Jesus do with this anointing power? Peter says he went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. Now we tend to focus on that intriguing statement, oppressed by the devil, but we overlook the first thing in that list, the first thing Jesus did in his ministry. Peter says he went about doing good. You know, scholars want to debate what it means to heal someone oppressed by the devil, but doing good doesn't need much explanation, does it? Yes, you could say Jesus was a do-gooder. And you and I can and should be do-gooders too. We may not know how to he heal people oppressed by the devil. Not even sure what that means exactly. But we do know how to do good. We can show kindness and compassion to those in need. We can show patience and generosity to those near us. We can give of ourselves to causes that help others. We know what it means to do good. It may mean different things to different people, but at heart we all know what it means to do good. We know an opportunity when we see one. Hold the door for a senior citizen, volunteer for the emergency shelter partnership, reduce, reuse, recycle. There are lots of ways to do good. And at the heart of the gospel, that's what it is all about. It may sound simplistic, but renewing our vision for 2020 is partly about getting back to basics, isn't it? And there's nothing more basic than a commitment to doing good. Maybe the Boy Scouts were onto something when they talked about doing a good deed each day. Doing good may sound simple, but it is not easy. In fact, it can be downright dangerous. Peter says in his sermon that doing good got Jesus killed. But God would not let that evil get the last word and God raised him from the dead. 
Peter then identifies himself and the other disciples as witnesses to all that God did in Jesus Christ. In fact, he emphasizes that they sat and ate and drank with him, which was partly to prove that the resurrection was more than just a vision. They ate and drank with him. But it also has sacramental overtones, doesn't it? It sounds like communion. They ate and drank with him, and then you and I continue to eat and drink one bread and one cup as a reminder of the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. And so here's where we go back to school like I did with the children at the font. Uh, this story has both sacraments, isn't it? In, it, in it, doesn't it? We have two sacraments in the Presbyterian Church, and the confirmation kids know what they are. Brad, what are they? And, and communion, there you go. <laughs> and both our sacraments are in, are, and there'll be a test on that later. The sacrament of baptism initiates on, us into the faith and communion then connects us with one another and with the Holy Spirit who gives us the vision and the strength to continue to do good in Jesus' name. Peter wraps it up by saying that what he is committed to in his life is doing good. He knows he is called, he has a vision, and it is to preach this good news of God's love revealed in Jesus Christ. And the implication is that you and I are to share that vision and to get to work and to start doing good in his name. Well, there's a lot in those eight little verses, isn't there? We spent three hours on those verses in Scottsdale and we barely scratched the surface. That's the beauty and mystery of scripture. There's depth of meaning to be discovered with each new reading. Each new generation encounters the word of God and figures out what it means for them. During our week, we interacted with stories from Acts in a variety of ways. Sometimes we discussed it in small groups, and other times we tried even to draw a picture to illustrate the message. On the day we looked at this passage, we were broken into small groups with the assignment of writing a six-word sermon. Not a sermon title, but a sermon. In other words, we were to describe the takeaway of Peter's words in six of our own. And it's harder than you think. We came up with sermons like, Fear and Live in Christ's Resurrection. Now, yes, I know contractions are kind of cheating. There's, <laughs> you get two words in one, but, but that's okay. They allowed it. Others were, Spirit Moves Even When We Don't. Wait a minute. Yeah, that's six. I almost thought that was seven. Spirit Moves Even When We Don't. Or, how can we hold healing power? My favorite was, you know he's Lord, don't you? And our group came up with a provocative question, do we fear living healing power? Six word sermons, how about you? Can you summarize this sermon in six words? Pastor Dale talked too long again? <laughs> or, <laughs> hopefully that's not it. The view from the water is dot, dot, dot. Or the Lord's baptism is my baptism. Think about it. Try to come up with six words to reflect what this message means to you. And so as we continue worship, I invite you to see if there aren't six words that you could come up with to summarize your vision of what God is calling you to be for 2020. And if you're so inclined, as we wrap up our service, you could share those six words. That's what I was thinking that Art would be here. He would do that. <laughs> I found it helpful and a thought-provoking uh, exercise. It also helped me memorize this message, and we all know I need help memorizing things these days. In closing, I want to share with you a powerful sermon illustration from architecture, church architecture. This story from Acts took place in Joppa, which is on the Mediterranean Sea, now modern Tel Aviv. It's right on the Mediterranean coast. And in most Catholic churches, the altar traditionally is placed at the east end of the church so that some people are looking toward Jerusalem. But in Joppa, they told us that they deliberately placed the altar at the west end of the church to symbolize the power of this story of Peter and the centurion. In this story, you see Peter caught a vision for sharing the gospel with all people of going west, not headed toward Jerusalem, but headed toward Rome, the capital of the empire and the whole world. Well, it's a new year and a new decade. A lot will happen in 
2020. But before we get any deeper into what is going to be a very intense year, I think, let's check out our vision. Let's remember the view from the water, the water of baptism, the baptism of our Lord and our own baptism. And from there, we can see what God is calling us to do and be. Our vision is to do good. Hey, that's a six-word sermon right there. Our vision is to do good. Simple but clear, like 2020 vision. Amen.